Good morning. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. If you're not, you know that I've been talking about a lot of Christmas traditions. Now, I want to get this out of the way. In the beginning, I have nothing against Christmas traditions. If you go upstairs after the service, we have fellowship in our cafe. You're going to see all kinds of decorations and Christmassy stuff. It's just that this here is about the word. That there is about the world, right? So they're just later traditions developed much later. So this morning, I want to start with one that you probably all know about if you've been in church uh, during Christmas season. That is the Advent wreath. And so I heard a story about a boy in a more traditional church where they had an Advent wreath. And again, nothing wrong with that, but I'll explain to you where it comes from. Uh, main issue here, fire. We don't really want to have fire. <laughs> so that's why we don't have a barbecue grill. We can't have nice things, right? We can't have fire <laughs> here. No, we don't want to do that. Anyway, we've had candle problems too. Heather will tell you about it later. She can vent a little Christmas stuff. So anyway, the Advent wreath, the boy's there. They're setting everything up for church. He's kind of excited. And he notices the guy who's usually one of the ushers. He's getting the Advent wreath ready. He grabs the candle and he does something unusual. He cuts the bottom of the candle. Kind of like the way you'd cut like a carpenter's pencil, like an old school kind of thing. So it's got the bottom the shape of a pencil. And he puts it in the advent wreath. And so the boy goes to inspect it. And he notices that the candle holders themselves are plenty big for the candles. He didn't need to cut it. So he asks the usher, why did you cut the candle? I don't know. I've always done it that way. Go ask one of the deacons. The deacons think they know everything, right? So, <laughs> ah, church people. So they asked one of the deacons. <laughs> they, uh, they asked one of the deacons, right? And of course, the deacon knows the answer. Well, everybody knows that when you cut the candle that way, it lasts longer. It'll last the entire Christmas season and never run out. Boy was like, huh? I didn't really understand that. So he made the mistake of asking his parents. We talked about this last week. And so immediately they're arguing because they have different ideas about why the candle's cut. So the boy kind of intervenes and he says, you know what? Let's ask the pastor. Yeah, the dad's really confident. He'll settle this and prove that I'm right. So they wait till after service, check, to ask the pastor for a meeting. And he figures, okay, it's Christmas time, right? People are kind of butting heads now. There's a lot of raw emotions during this season, so they need a meeting. I'm busy, but I'm going to put that on the priority list because, you know, I don't want anything to happen in the marriage. So he figures it's the marriage. So the day comes, and the couple arrives, the mom and dad, in the office. But strangely, the boy follows them in. It's like, all right, what, you, you did something wrong at school. Like, what's going on? Now, here's the thing. You ever get a text that says something like, we need to talk? Did you like that? Neither did the pastors. No, we don't like that either. So don't do that. So anyway, <laughs> leave this in the position. We don't know what's going on, right? So we're trying to figure, naturally, you're trying to figure it out. And so he's sitting there like, why is the boy here? And then what you do in the pastor office is small talk, right? So you try to kind of make him feel comfortable. And so it's kind of awkward for a little while. And that's what's going on. The pastor, we're trained to have some patience through that. And so we're sitting there, you know, just listening, mm, you know, still thinking. We're like listening to you, but not really thinking about what it is that you can't into my office for. The boy is not trained like that. He's a boy. So he just jumps on it. He's like, Pastor, we're here about the Advent wreath. And so this is what, hmm. and this is what we're saying everything we want to say in our mind and not with our mouth. So hmm. the Advent wreath. Yeah, particularly the candle. Why do you cut the candles? Why do they do that? Hmm, okay. He says, well, I don't know why they cut the candles like that. No clue. But I do know why I used to cut the candles like that. You see, many years ago, when we founded this church, it was really small. And we had a really small Advent wreath. And I couldn't find proper-looking Advent candles that fit in the wreath. 
So I'd cut the bottoms to make them fit. And everybody's quiet. You got me thinking, he says to the couple. Maybe next year we'll do away with the Advent wreath so we don't have to have meetings like this one. Yeah. <laughs> Why do things disappear in church, right? Now you know the secret. <laughs> okay. Indeed, we see a lot of traditions during this season that many can't seem to accurately explain. So, we are going to be continuing in our four-part series, Ruining Christmas Traditions with Pastor Gene. <laughs> <laughs> so we ruined the manger scene, right? We did that already. We ruined gift giving. Now we're going to ruin the Advent wreath. <laughs> There'll be more to it than that. But anyway, it's not found anywhere in the Bible, nor is it found in the early church at all. Some say it's a pagan tradition, and that's why, not why we don't have one here. Some say it's later on. Historians will tell us that the first Advent wreath, or some historians, depending on who you talk to, early 1800s by a German pastor. So, uh, Protestant pastor, Johann Heinrich Wickham, I think. You pronounce it like that. He was known for his missional work to the poor and orphans. And the kids would be bugging him, when's Christmas coming? When's Christmas coming? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And so what he did is he started an Advent wreath. And it had, so I get this right here, 20 red candles and four white ones. That's a lot of fire, right? So he was brave. And so he had a lot of candles. So picture like one of those, uh, what are they, the advent calendars that you have where you open up the door and you get a little piece of chocolate or something like that. Like that. So it was for the children. Anyway, <laughs> that's the story of the advent wreath. And people have argued about traditions like this for years. And in doing so, they kind of miss the point, don't they, if we're being honest. Now, this is the thing. In a non-denominational church, we're always trying to cut through those traditions to the word. Right? So what does it say here? Right? So we look at that. But sadly, <laughs> through the traditions of man, the church has often chosen tradition over truth. That's kind of a problem. So we know that Jesus didn't have an advent wreath. What if I told you that Jesus didn't have a Christmas tree either? Ooh, we know that. But Jesus didn't observe many of the Christmas traditions that we do today, nor did the early church. And so what we want to do today, we're going to look at a tradition that Jesus observed this time of year. So you may have heard the question, what would Jesus do? Maybe you heard that. What would, good question. What would Jesus do? Today, we're going to ask another one. What would Jesus be doing this season or this week? We're going to try to answer that. In order to get the answer to that question, we have to go back to the Bible of the early church. If you've been here before, I'm going to keep this explanation really short. So I'm just going to get to it. Uh, if you have questions about this, uh, you can ask me, you can email me, and I will answer. Uh, it goes throughout the series. So you can go to the intro of this series, and you'll get all the information. Uh, so again, the Bible of the early church, when you're looking at the earliest copies that we have, right? So complete copies. We have like incomplete copies all the way down, almost like after John when the ink is wet, really close. But when you're looking at the whole Bible to try to get an understanding of what books they were reading, what it looked like, you'll see a Bible that has two unique features. And some won't really get this, although it's completely well known within scholarship. First unique feature that surprised me coming from a Protestant background is that it was all in Greek, even the Old Testament. So that kind of blew my mind at first. But makes sense. They're writing the New Testament in Greek. They're quoting the Old Testament in Greek. It's the lingua franca of the day. The other thing that kind of blew my mind is that in the Old Testament portion, it had 14, anywhere from 14 to 16 more books in it. That was interesting when I found that out. That's what they were reading. So, fun facts. Contained this book we're going to look at today, Maccabees. There are four of them. 
And while denominations will disagree about whether this is Scripture or not, we're not going to do that here, even Martin Luther said they were good to read and included them in his translation of the Bible. A lot of people don't know that either. So these books, and this is an interesting thing if you've never heard this before to consider, these books were in all Bibles for the first round numbers 1,800 years of our 2,000-year Christian history. Think about that. They were in all Bibles, so from the beginning, right, all Bibles, 1,800 years of our 2,000-year Christian history, like 90% of it or something like that, including the 1611 King James Bible. So that's Maccabees in a 1611 King James Bible. It was in there. So there it is. If you cannot read that, it's kind of hard to read. It's even harder to read than the King James is today. Uh, I'm just going to quickly suggest a couple physical Bibles because you're like, oh, well, mine doesn't have it. Which one does? NRSV. NRSV is pretty good. A lot of people don't know it comes from that pedigree. So you can trace it all the way back to the King James Bible. So after that, you have the British Standard Version, 1901. You have the American Standard Version. It's all about just trying to update the language. Then you have the Revised Standard Version in the mid-1900s. And then you have the New Revised Standard Version, NRSV. So if you like the analog paper Bible, that's a good one. The scriptures I'll be using today are GNT, Good News Translation, or GNTD if you're looking it up in your app, if you like the digital things. Moving on, Maccabees. We're going to focus on 1 and 2. Uh, so the Maccabees, those books, even if you're not regarding them as scripture, they give us really good historical accounts of what happened 200 years-ish before Jesus. So we kind of get an idea of what's going on in the world. It's very interesting. So we have this time when Alexander the Great dies, and then his generals are going to take things over. There's four of them. The focus is on two of them. And so that's what it's looking at. Also, we get a window into a festival that's celebrated this time of year when it's kind of what it comes from that Jesus also celebrated this time of year. So it's going to be kind of interesting. Jewish people still celebrate it today. First and second Maccabees is what we're going to focus on. They kind of run in parallel, like second Kings and second Chronicles, for example. So similarish things are going on and you're just getting sort of different perspectives of the same account, more information. So it's kind of what's going on here. Second Maccabees focuses a little bit more on like God's hand in the whole thing. So it's kind of more theological. Third Maccabees, uh, that does not appear in as many old Bibles, not the 1611 King James. It happens about 50 years before what we're going to talk about today, so we're not going to talk about that. Fourth Maccabees is super, super interesting. Uh, it is an amazing, if you like philosophy, you like deep reading, really like getting into something and something making you think deep, a masterpiece, the first chapter especially, is brilliant. And so, Great philosophical work. Then it goes to martyrdom. That's a big thing in Maccabees. Suffering and dying, ultimately, for what you believe. And so it goes through Eleazar, a priest that dies for what he believes, and then a woman and her seven sons. They all get tortured and die for what they believe. She dies as well. In 2 Maccabees, the account's like one chapter, barely. This is like many, 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 many chapters. It's, it's a lot of graphic detail. One thing that you will notice if you're reading uh, Maccabees is that there are a lot of battle scenes. So if you like epic battles, Maccabees is for you. So like there's a picture of it here. So <clears throat> it's amazing. So now what you have is not just like the Old Testament chariots and this stuff. You have different nations coming in and you start to get giant war elephants and they describe like these huge war elephants and how many people fit on the little basket and how they're outfitted and armored and all this stuff. And it kind of makes me think of Lord of the Rings. And I even looked it up, and apparently, Tolkien, is that his name? He was a, a Christian, and he ripped off a lot of Maccabees stuff. So that's what happened. So this is where Legolas gets all his moves. So if you're watching the movie, no joke, when you read it, literally, like a guy stabs an elephant from underneath, it comes down and kills him. It's pretty amazing stuff. So big, big epic battle scenes. Our focus today will be on the Maccabean Revolt. So we're going to look at 1 Maccabees 1 through 4 and 2 Maccabees 8 through 10, seven-ish chapters. Let's hop right in. Maccabees 1, 1. The story begins 
when Alexander the Great, son of Philip of Macedonia, marched from Macedonia and attacked Darius, king of Persia and Media. Should sound a little familiar, right? Alexander enlarged the Greek Empire by defeating Darius and seizing his throne. He fought many battles, captured fortified cities, and put the kings of the region to death. As he advanced to the ends of the earth, he plundered many nations. And when he had conquered the world, he became proud and arrogant. By building up a strong army, he dominated whole nations and their rulers and forced everyone to pay him taxes. When Alexander had been emperor for 12 years, he fell ill and realized that he was about to die. He called together his generals, noblemen, and people who had been brought up with him since his early childhood, and he divided his empire, giving a part to each of them. After his death, the generals took control, and each had himself crowned king of his own territory. The descendants of these kings ruled for many generations and brought a great deal of misery on the world. So, this all connects. Do you remember Daniel? Remember Daniel roughly 8-ish through 11-ish? They're giving these prophecies. The one that's kind of like hard to say because, what is it? The goat rams the ram, right? So the goat is the one with the one horn. That represents Alexander the Great, right? Persian media is the other. Rams them, four horns grow out, another prominent horn. This is Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Fourth. And then we get these other predictions that are going to happen. This is what is being talked about. So if you don't have Maccabees in your Bible, you're kind of like, huh? And then left to speculate and come up with things that are wrong. And this is why if you look at some copies of the Bible of the early church, if you have a Lexham English Septuagint, uh, Septuagint, I guess, uh, L-E-S, some of you bought that at the beginning of the series, believe in there, Maccabees is right after Daniel. And it makes sense because it takes you, you go, oh, that's just what had been prophesied there. Now, we're going to talk about other prophecies that do go to Jesus. And later, yes, they're all in there, but it's like this time, that time, this time, that time. So, interesting. What you're dealing with here is the, the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Not that show, a different show. So, anyway, <laughs> so you're, yeah, we're, we're dealing with the kings of the north. Just think of it like Syria. It's like that, that region. Kings of the south, think of it like Egypt. And so the Ptolemies, this is where Cleopatra is going to come from. She's like the sixth. So Cleopatra is going to come from the Ptolemies. So it's, it's weird for us to think of because they're Greek. They come from Greece, right? They're Greek generals, and they're blending into these other societies. So like these, these uh, you know, Syrian society here, that's the Seleucids, where Antiochus comes from. And then you have the Ptolemies. And this is this whole big dynasty, and they become like Greek, but then they're Egyptians. It's kind of a strange historical crossover. Nobody really thinks about that. So Antiochus Epiphanes, bad dude. He's no good. He's really wicked. And so what happens is, so he's like uh, the second son after his father, one of Alexander's generals. So he's the fourth, actually. And so... <laughs> What it says is, it'll, it'll just describe him, and then it'll talk about these, what they call like bad influences, these traitorous Jews, and they have no regard for the law. So what happens is, naturally, the Jewish people are going to say, okay, you know, we're just going to serve under you and adopt your customs, and they abandon the law, so sound familiar, right? They start abandoning God's rules, the law, the customs, the traditions, and then it gets disgusting for the first time, <laughs> because among these traditions, they abandon circumcision. But what if you were already circumcised? They were getting uncircumcised. What? Yes, what? That's enough. Yeah, exactly. So, like, anyway, <laughs> we're not going to, yeah, no jokes, no jokes. Okay, good, I'm good. So what they end up doing is they build a stadium. Now, if you're reading it back then, you're going, you know, because you know what this means, what they're going to do. They build a stadium. Now, it's not bad. Sports are not bad. Christians, go do your sports. That's fine. Just try not to do them on Sundays. But anyway, well, during church, right? So, so not bad, not bad. Jews, there's like nothing that I can recall in the Old Testament against like playing basketball, for example. So it's all good. Um, but you see the Greeks, uh, they would do their sports in the nude. That was a thing. Don't want to go back there, right? So, <laughs> no. So anyway, they would. And so they would know if you were Jewish. <laughs> so you would get uncircumcised. That's the thing. Enough of that. Anyway, the book goes into that whole thing. So 
we get this situation where Antiochus, he's going to go after Ptolemy in Egypt, and he has some victories, kind of chases him away. He has to retreat for a while. He turns around, and then he comes back and says, okay, I'm going to get the Jewish people. So he starts attacking lands of Judah. He gets to Jerusalem, and he takes away all the stuff into some of the stuff in the temple. He's very arrogant, right? So this is bad. It kind of starts reminding you of what? Nebuchadnezzar, that kind of thing. It's bad. It happens to them. Uh, Also, very, very deceitful. And what happens, another bad thing, what they do is they build a fortress in Jerusalem right near the temple. All right, so now it just, it's a wreck. The whole thing's a total mess for the Jewish people. He ends up making decrees. So he does away with the law. You're not allowed to read the law or you die. And he makes Judaism basically illegal. They want them to all become Gentiles. But it gets worse. The mothers who circumcise their children, they die and they hang the babies. So it's a horrible, horrible guy. No good. Bad. Um, they also set up, and this is going to be familiar, the abomin- abomination that causes desolation. You probably heard Jesus say that. Well, there's kind of like two. This is the first one. So they set that up. It's real bad. That's what's being predicted. But then if you know, in like Mark 13, Matthew 24, that's what Jesus is talking about. That's the Romans. This here, though, gets set up. It's what Daniel had predicted. Now, the point where it moves in is that the good Jewish people they are going to refrain from all of this. And so they would rather die. So that's basically what's going on. If you're hopping back and forth, you get the story here about the woman and the seven sons, right? So they give you examples of how these people, they just, they're martyrs. They just die for what they believe. Then it segues in. You get this guy named Mattathias. If you turn the page, chapter 2, Mattathias shows up. And he's a priest. And he's also kind of a warrior. It says he has five sons. And one of them is... Judas Maccabeus, or Judah Maccabees, two different ways that you can say it. Either way, fine, we're not speaking the original language. So what happens is, there he's saying, no, no, we shouldn't do this. He's a you know, righteous guy, he's a priest, and one guy stands up to sacrifice anyway, like something he shouldn't, basically like a big thing in the book is like pig's flesh. You're not supposed to eat pig if you're Jewish. So he's doing something like that. And Judah, or I'm sorry, Mattathias decides, okay, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> so he kills this guy, then he kills the official there, ordering everybody to do it. And then you start getting a lot of this, they recall things in the Old Testament. So he's like Phineas, who chucked the spear through Zimri and Cosby, right? So he killed them for being with the Midian women. And so it'll start to recall all this stuff. So it's kind of cool if you know the Old Testament real well. And then what he does is he heads for the hills. He goes out in the wilderness, some versions say, mountains. And then he starts like this guerrilla army. And then you have this whole thing with like the Sabbath because, okay, can we fight on the Sabbath? If we're being like religious and righteous, can we fight on the Sabbath? And one group decides not to. And so they slaughter them. And so Mattathias is like, okay, we fight on the Sabbath. <laughs> Let's do that. So he starts like raiding them and all this other stuff. And uh, he's kind of mean. Uh, he's enacting revenge. He is uh, forcibly circumcising people who aren't. Uh, so they're just growing and growing and growing, getting a bigger and bigger army. And then finally the time comes for him to die. And he hands the mantle over to Judah Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus. Uh, Maccabees meaning hammer. So That's where you get the Hebrew hammer from, if you heard of that, right? So that's what he's all about. So now enter Judah Maccabees. And I made you a little chart. If you're interested, uh, you can go through that. That's kind of like like the parallel-ish chart there of how they work together. Kind of difficult. Uh, So there's like a poem about him. And so if we go to the picture, he's like this real, like... uh, Big hero, Judas brought greater glory to his people in his armor. He was like a giant. He took up his weapons and went to war with his own sword. He defended his camp. He was like a ferocious roaring lion as it attacks. Judas hunted down those who broke the law. He made life miserable for many kings and brought joy to the people of Israel. We will praise him forever for what he did. So he's like this big war hero. Uh, He has some very... It's kind of like, not small victories, but uh, Apollonius against this guy, Apollonius, a general. And it says he uses Apollonius' sword to the day he dies. Um, Sauron, sound familiar? Right. And so they have this battle there. I believe that's the one. It's kind of like the movie 300 where it's like a narrow pass. The whole time he's encouraging his people. They have a smaller army, but he's saying, no, 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 the Lord will fight for us. It sounds like very Old Testament-ish. So now what happens is the wicked king, it ends up costing him tons of money, almost 
bankrupts him. So it's really, really bad. He has to go to other places to get the money to build up this army. He puts a guy named Lysias in charge, and you get the names of all these different generals just kind of passing over quickly. Nicanor, Gorgias, and so you get Ptolemy. They are friends of the king. You're going to hear that phrase a lot. Friends of the king or relative of the king. That's Lysias. So he's like second in command, even in command of his, or in charge of his son. So now you can bring up the chart just where we are. Judas hears about it. That's 1 Maccabees 3, 2 Maccabees 8. And he starts again encouraging his people, getting his army together. And he ends up defeating all of them. So Gorgias he defeats. It's like he defeats, like he bring, comes with an army. It gets larger and larger each time. 5,000 guys. Judah defeats like 3,000. Second Maccabees, we see some other generals. Timothy has nothing to do with the New Testament. Timothy, and again, encouraging him. Don't worry about the size of the army. And each time he's beating them, each time with a much smaller force. Finally, uh, Lysias himself the next year brings like 65,000, depending on the version you're reading, against Judas's 10,000. Again, much smaller army. He defeats them. They flee. So then it cuts away. is where it gets really complicated because it jumps in 1 Maccabees. You can show the chart. And then in 2 Maccabees, it just kind of flows right through nicely. What happens is, is Antiochus is then punished. He's given this awful stomach disease. It makes a note that like he smells so bad that his people can't go near him at all. The point is God is just humbling him. And finally, he gets humble to the point where he writes a nice letter to the Jewish people. He tries to make up. All right, so it segues to that, then back to what we're talking about. Then we get to today, like what's going on during the season. First Maccabees 436. So they have more battles. Then we get Judas and his brothers said, now that our enemies have been defeated, let's go to Jerusalem and purify the temple and rededicate it. Remember, it's been defiled. So the whole army was assembled and went up to Mount Zion. There they found the temple abandoned, the altar profaned, the gates burned down, the courtyards grown up in a forest of weeds, and the priest's rooms torn down. In their sorrow, they tore their clothes, cried loudly, threw ashes on their head, and fell face down on the ground. When the signal was given on the trumpets, everyone cried out to the Lord. Then Judas ordered some of his soldiers to attack the men in the fort. Remember the fort just north of it, where he pur- while he purified the temple. And we hop to 2 Maccabees. Judas Maccabeus and his followers under the leadership of the Lord, recaptured the temple and the city of Jerusalem. They tore down the altars which foreigners had set up in the marketplace and destroyed the other places of worship that had been built. They purified the temple and built a new altar. Then, with new fire started by striking flint, they offered sacrifice for the first time in two years, burned incense, lighted the lamps, and set out sacred loaves. After they had done all this, they lay face down on the ground and prayed that the Lord would never again let such disasters strike them. They begged him to be merciful when he punished them for future, future sins and not hand them over uh, any, to any more barbaric uh, pagan Gentiles. They rededicated the temple on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, kind of like December, <laughs> Kislev, the same day of the month on which the temple had been desecrated by the Gentiles. The happy celebration lasted eight days, like the Festival of Shelters, and the people remembered how only a short time before they had spent the Festival of Shelters wandering like wild animals in the mountains and living in caves. But now, carrying green palm branches and sticks decorated with ivy, they paraded around singing grateful praises to him who had brought about the purification of his own temple. Everyone agreed that the entire Jewish nation should celebrate this festival each year. So here we see where Hanukkah comes from. This is the origin of Hanukkah. You've probably heard of Hanukkah. So this is it. Now, there are a lot of later traditions like we Christians have around the holidays. Uh, The menorah. It is not in this story. It's completely absent from the story, but they lit candles, right? Later traditions, like if you go to the to Talmud and you look up later traditions, you'll see that there's uh, a legend that Judas Maccabeus and his followers, they lit a candle. They only had enough oil for one day, but it lasts eight days. And so that's why you have the menorah. So you have these eight candles and the other candle you use to light the other ones to celebrate. That's what they're celebrating. That's what it is, the miracle of the oil that lasts the full eight days so that the temple stays lit for the whole festival. There you go. So there's one thing I want to just 
draw your attention to. Because when you start talking about the Maccabees, again, we're non-denominational, so we don't argue about this stuff. 60% of Christians read from these books, right? So we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Some don't, but they kind of argue about it, and that defeats the whole purpose, right? So we're not going to do that. But you will see an argument here come up over these books. I want to just take a second and clarify it, a little theological, but we'll get back to the application here. So one thing to notice, in the accounts, and if you're reading it, you'll notice, I just breezed over it really quick, but what Judas Maccabeus does a lot is he consults the law a lot. He's looking at the books of the law. Like, what do we do? Let's look at the law. He prays a lot. So it seems to be, and it says, you know, at the direction of the Lord, these things are happening. There's one time when he does not consult with the law. If we keep reading, 2 Maccabees 12, 38. So um, there are more battles going on. So after the battle, Judas led his men to the town of Adullam. Sound familiar? It was the day before the Sabbath. So they purified themselves according to Jewish custom, and they observed the holy day. By the following day, it was urgent that they gather up the bodies of the men who had been killed in battle and bury them in their family tombs. But on each of the dead, hidden under their clothes, they found small idols, like images of the false gods, worshipped in Jamnia, which the law forbids Jews to wear. Everyone knew why these men had been killed, so they praised the ways of the Lord, the just judge, who reveals what is hidden. And they begged him that this sin might be completely blotted out. Then Judas, that great man, urged the people to keep away from sin, because they had seen for themselves what had happened to those men who had sinned. He also took up a collection from all his men, totaling about four pounds of silver, and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. Judas did this noble thing because he believed in the resurrection of the dead. If he had not believed that the dead would be raised, it would have been foolish and useless to pray for them. In his firm and devout conviction that all God's faithful people would receive a wonderful reward, Judas made a provision for a sin offering to set free from their sin those who had died. So the author's like kind of making excuses for him. Why? Because this is not anywhere in the law of Moses. <laughs> It is not. It is wrong. It's not a good thing. So this is one of the objections to this book, that he's making prayer for the dead. So here's the thing, just to be crystal clear. Yes, we are non-denominational, but there are certain things where, no, like I can say, you're wrong. Prayer for the dead, that's one of them. What you decide here in your life on earth, <laughs> that will determine your destiny. That's it. <laughs> That's it. All right? So this is affirmed. If you do not believe, you know, so other certain denominations believe, read Luke 16. Jesus affirms this very clearly. Lazarus and the rich man. Check it out. First Timothy, right? There is only what? One mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. All right? So it's very, very, very bad thinking. So not to pick on anybody, it's horrible thinking. Think about it. If uh, like, I knew Heather could pray for me, right, after I die, and then I'll be set. Well, I can just then do whatever I want, can't I? That's really dangerous theology. And indeed, it became horrible. We had indulgences, and this is the, really the Reformation, what it's essentially about. It led to that because, you know, hey, ah, you pay me enough money, I'll make sure Grandpa's set. You know, it's just, it's very, very, very bad theology. So just, just to say that, if people talk about that, pray for the dead, we don't do that here. So, this mistake, and that's what it is on Judas Maccabeus' part, uh, is the reason some will point out, like, for the removal of all the rest of the books, too. Uh, even though, remember, it was in there for 1,800 years. Like, the, think of it this way. Like, the apostles didn't have a problem with it. So, they, and here's the other thing. And I want to make this point about the Bible, because a lot of people will do this. I've, I've, even pastors, they're like, try to make this story about you. Right? Or they try to make other heroes. This is only about Jesus. That's it. All right? So there's no other heroes in the Bible. So if we tore out every book of the Bible, right, where someone did something stupid and then someone stupid made a doctrine out of it, we would be left without a Bible. <laughs> all right? So we see, quote, heroes. Do this all the time. We talked about this. If you've been here for a long time, you've heard this. If you haven't, you probably haven't heard about this. But think about it, right? Abraham, Abram and Sarai, right? Abraham, he is deceitful. What does he do to Pharaoh, 
right? Causes problems. What does he do to Abimelech of Gerar? He deceives him. Listen, Sarah, don't tell him you're beautiful, so don't tell him you're my wife. You're my sister. Well, that's half true. So he's like a half deceiver, right? And that's gross. But if we move on, Isaac, you wouldn't think he would do anything wrong, did the same thing to Abimelech of Gerar again. <laughs> but this time he's totally a liar. <laughs> tell him, you're my sister. Nope. No, that's Rebecca. That's your wife, bro. So what if, right, I want to come along right now. Well, I, I come along and I say, guys, I think it would be really cool if it was okay that we deceive people. Let's come up with the doctrine of deceit. All right? Why? Abraham did it. Isaac did it. All right? And then someone will come along and say, nope, we got to rip Genesis out of the Bible. That would be bad thinking, wouldn't it? Yes, because Abraham, and I, they're just men. They're just flawed humans. They're not heroes at all. All right, so just remember that. We could do the same thing with David. It's not just Bathsheba. <laughs> it is not the adultery. First of all, deceiving. <laughs> deceiving people. Achish of gas. He's deceiving him. And what is he doing? Raiding parties. He's killing lots of people. And this is actually the stated reason that he does not get to build the temple. It's not the adultery. It's that he shed much blood. He murdered a lot of people. When you go on these raiding parties, you kill the women and children too, right? And it's not exactly commanded by the Lord. But also, Ahimelech, the high priest, he deceives him. He flat out lies to him about his mission, and he gets his whole family killed. That's his fault. It's really bad. So what do we do? Ah, First and Second Samuel, rip them out. Right? You know what I mean? Would that be the right? No, the appropriate response. No. We must look at the Bible correctly. Judas Maccabeus is not the hero of the story. We run into theological problems when we do that. So if a human falling short is like the reason we're going to tear a book of the Bible, we'd be left without the Bible at all. So look, there's only one hero in the Bible that comes in the form of a man, and that is Jesus. That's it. He's the only one we should be looking to as a guiding light. Paul will say, use me, Epaphroditus, Timothy, as examples, but he clarifies, because we are following Jesus, right? So, like, if you're not mature enough to get there, okay, just take a baby step towards me. Come on, come on. That's all he's doing. Ultimately, my job, everybody, Jesus, just there, there. We do baby steps. We help you along, but walk on your own after a while and walk in the light. Walk in the Lord. So, with that in mind, let's answer the initial question. What would Jesus be doing this time of year? New Testament, John 10, 22. It was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. Some versions will say festival of lights. Remember, the menorah. He was in the temple walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. The people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I have already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is in the work I do in my Father's name. Some of you may know that today is Hanukkah. It's Hanukkah today. So if you're Jewish or if you just feel like doing it, you want to get a menorah and celebrate, you can do that. Tonight begins Hanukkah. It is the beginning of that festival, and this is what Jesus would be doing today. It's what he did. The Word of God tells us that. Also called the Festival of the Maccabees. So I'm not going to mention it. It's a TV show and a funny story. I'm not, we, I can't know. I'm not going to do that. Okay. So anyway, Jewish people know this. It's in pop culture. They talk about the Maccabees a lot. So now when you hear this, you'll go, oh, I know what they're talking about. And rightly, this is why the King James, the 1611 King James, says that when you're looking... At John 10, 22, and I made a little mark there. It's tiny, I know, whatever. But <laughs> go check out 1 Maccabees 4. So the King James translators are saying, oh, you want to go over to Maccabees now that we kept in the Bible. Yeah. Okay, if we go back to John, John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Indeed, Jesus is now the light of the world. He's not just an eight-day light. He's not a temporary light. 
He is the light that we are to follow, the guiding light that we are to walk in, the eternal light. Now, if we keep reading the rest of the story, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit towards like the end-ish, and we're going to take a look at Jesus coming back. You sang it in the song, coming back with fire in his eyes. Yes, certainly. Jesus will come back. So if you know the basic idea here, Jesus is crucified and dies according to the scriptures. He's buried, third day, rises from the dead. That was the big deal in the early church, the resurrection. They're celebrating that every Sunday. Amazing. 40 days, he ascends to heaven. But with the promise, he's going to come back to restore the kingdom. But here, faith, you don't know. Only the Father knows. What's the point? You are to be living every day like he's coming back today. That's the point. That's faith. So don't believe people, right? So there's one common denominator among all end times prophecy. They're all wrong. <laughs> They've all been wrong through the ages. None of them are right. They miss the point. People doing this are not people of faith, and they're not preaching to people of faith. You need to just believe. He's coming back, and in the meantime... I'm going to be behaving like he's coming back. And that's what this is all about. Mark 13, Matthew 24. Be ready. Be ready. And he gives all the parables about what? Being ready for the master's return. Be ready. That's the point. So when you get to the end, Jesus comes back. So this is the prophecy about it. This is what we believe in as Christians. This is how we build our faith. He's coming. And he's going to judge both the living and the dead. Well, that's what it says. So it's good for some people, bad for others. But check this out. Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is prophecy, future. The first heaven and earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with his people. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. That sounds really nice, doesn't it? Right? So that is what we place our hope in. But did you catch it? That heaven and earth won't be like this one. For Peter, melts. <laughs> this earth will be destroyed, gone. Everyone like celebrating Earth Day is like, no! <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but <laughs> it's Jesus. <laughs> Don't argue with me. Right? So, yeah, it's, <clears throat> that's it. It's gone. New heaven and new earth, not like this corrupted one. That's what we're, got to stop trying to make this heaven. It's not, we're told. We're going to get a new heaven and a new earth, and that's what we look forward to. If we keep reading, check this out in light of what we looked at today. Revelation 21, 22. I did not see a temple in the city. Don't need that. Because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. They're gone too. Because the glory of God shines on it and the lamb is its lamp. The peoples of the world will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring wealth into it. If we keep reading, it reiterates this point. Revelation 22, 5. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. God will finally be enough. Because of the sun, we won't have a need for the sun. And we'll walk in his light forever. There will be no temple. We will not need the buildings. We will not need the traditions. We will not need the menorah. His light will be enough. Maccabees gives us a historical understanding of what Jesus was celebrating this time of year. And as Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Jewish festivals, he is the light of the world that will never run out. It also gives hope 
and encouragement to Christians who are suffering today. If we go back to the New Testament, we'll find another quote of Maccabees in Hebrews. Hebrews 11 talks about what faith is. What is faith? Faith is the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. That's the point. That's how the Bible defines it. Then we see the people of faith. It gives a lot of different examples. Examples. Then there's some people that maybe you didn't know who they were. They're not named. Hebrews 11.35. Through faith, women received their dead relatives raised back to life. Others, refusing to accept freedom, died under torture in order to be raised to a better life. And rightly, the King James translators note that this is a quote going back to 2 Maccabees 7. Although we live in a dark world, we have the eternal light of the world. And so now during our time here, we walk in that light, as Jesus said. But we're given the hope, the promise that he will return and he will be our light forever and ever. No matter what it's like here, no matter what you're going through, no matter what suffering is occurring in your life, we're all going through something. I always say no one comes in here with a winning lotto ticket. But if that's you, please tithe. <laughs> it was getting serious. Just, <laughs> I'm good at ruining moments, not just Christmas traditions. But if that's you, we're all going through something. We're not unique. We are. Hopefully you don't all look like me. But we're not unique, right? We all go through struggles. And this time of year, it flares up because unrealistic expectations focus on Jesus and just realize this. Have faith. Draw yourself back to this. No matter what is happening to you, no matter what you're going through, that's going to happen to you. You're going to be with Jesus for eternity if you are in him. So with that in mind, I'd like to close with Scripture. 2 Corinthians 4.16. For this reason... We never become discouraged, even though our physical being is gradually decaying. Yet our spiritual being is renewed day after day. And this small and temporary trouble we suffer will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory, much greater than the trouble. For we fix our attention not on the things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but... What cannot be seen lasts forever. Amen.